So this is Barbara Carlstrom, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them as we get into the, the content. And this is Bud Roarson. And uh, our contact information is, is on the last slide, so which is up on the uh, UDL IRN page for this schedule, scheduled event. Uh, if you look under here at the participant resources, that's the, the link to a, a Google Drive folder that has resources for everything we're going to show you. Um, that's going to be a big part of what we want to accomplish with this, uh, with this presentation. So what we want to go through in the next uh, hour or so is when we look at universal design for learning and this concept of social emotional growth, uh, our, j our job in the next hour is to uh, help you see some connections in how these things can go together, uh, both conceptually, but also in terms of implementation. Uh, we're going to look at our district, Montgomery County Public Schools, and, and how these two things combine to work together in our districts. Our district. Uh, we're going to look at two schools, uh, one from Barbara's school, one from Bud's school, and talk about in two very different schools how they approached concurrently addressing UDL and, and, and SEL. Um, and some key components of that. And the big part of what we want you to get out of this is your takeaways. And your takeaways are going to focus about uh, what we feel like we learned and has worked well for us. As importantly, what we feel like uh, we've, we've learned that didn't work so well or we would do differently the next time. Um, and finally, a collection of resources, implementation tools that these two people have used at their school that they have found helpful. And my opinion in terms of supporting UDL implementation uh, across our country um, and around the world is a, a lot of what we can learn from each other, we can learn if we were doing more sharing of our resources. And so our goal today, if you are able to go to that Google Drive folder um, and access the collection of resources that we've put there, that's probably most of the benefit that we want you to get out of this session, but we hope you'll stay so we can describe a little bit about what, what we found helpful with all of these. So uh, these are our, our outcomes as they were listed in the program description. And I've hit most of those related, well, as I talked about the itinerary of where we want to go over the next hour, um, but they're there for you to review. So before we get started with what's happening at these two schools, it's important for you to understand what's happening in, in the state of Maryland and also in our, in our district related to UDL. So Maryland is one of the, the few, if only, uh, states in the country that has a, a really comprehensive legislation about how schools are supposed to use UDL um, in the business of teaching and learning. And there's five, uh, four components to that for the regulations, and our school district is required to in integrate those into their five-year master plan. And one of the elements that has come up in a number of sessions at the, at the IRN has been that UDL is not something that happens in the classroom. UDL is a comprehensive way of thinking of this work across different domains. And so when you develop curriculum or assessments, when you purchase materials, when you plan professional learning, when you're focused on giving feedback and growing instructional practices, this UDL lens need to be, needs to be incorporated in all that. And if you look on the Google Drive folder, I've included a copy of our five-year master plan, which describes what we've done in our district related to UDL. And I think that's one resource that might give you a little understanding of the, the levels of activities that can take place to support a more comprehensive approach to UDL. Uh, our role, uh, my role and the role of the Hyatt team is really this piece of trying to connect all these gears to, to make sure that people in curriculum are lining up or trying to make connections with people in purchasing uh, and these things are, are working in concert and we still have a lot of work to do but our goal is to really build those connections and, and make this more of a meaningful connected process. We will be sharing some specific examples from these schools. Uh, however, on the Hyatt website, if you Google Hyatt, uh, there are a number of exemplars that we have found helpful that might be a little more general than what you'll see from the two schools uh, to both increase awareness with UDL, uh, create learning uh, professional communities, and also uh, more systematically implement school school-wide. Uh, UDL. And so if you go to the web, our website, you'll find a lot of resources that might complement some of these or, or also um, be a little different than those. So when we talk about social-emotional learning and UDL, 
Uh, one thing that we found in these two schools that have really focused on connecting these two things is the connection can take place in two different ways. So if you haven't specifically focused on SEL or social emotional learning in your school, you'll you probably may not be aware that when people start doing this, they actually don't know what this means. And they, they really don't know exactly what they're looking to see in terms of a change in the classroom, a change in students. And there's two ways that we have found that UDL can support social emotional learning that we want to share with you today. Uh, and the first is, when we look at a, a UDL classroom, uh, you see increased access, increased engagement, and an increased focus on, on expert learners. And in a classroom that's more flexible, that has more opportunities for interaction, flexible pathways, what you start to see is that students have more opportunities uh, and teachers have more opportunities to have a community where they are building more significant relationships. And that's one key element when we've looked at these two schools. What we see is they focused on UDL as a way to really cultivate the conditions for social emotional learning in the classroom. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But more specifically, uh, when we talk about social emotional learning, there are specific SEL competencies, which in the course of implementing UDL and SEL, uh, schools can focus on. And we want to talk a little bit about those today and also talk in the example of Bud School, how they, how they come together. So we are not going to go into a lot of detail on how you can oper operationalize SEL, but CASEL is the one website and organization that has really done a lot of work around how to do this. And so how many of you have, uh, have heard of CASEL or, or utilized them? Okay, so not many. So uh, there are a couple different domains of, of competencies that they provide very specific ways of looking for changes in this in students and, and measuring it and also supporting growth around these. Uh, they are self-management, uh, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. So the first thing that we would like for you to do uh, as getting more engaged with this content uh, is when you think about these, these SEL competencies, and I would say that uh, pick one that you can draw some understanding from just by the name. And so the self-awareness piece, self-management piece, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And just talk to some people next to you about um, how, can, how can a learning environment designed with UDL help address these specific outcomes and changes in students. Then we want to hear a little bit about what, what, what you've seen or, or what you believe in this, in this area. So take a moment and just have that discussion and we want to hear from a couple of you. It to my drive the folder but then inside it says participants folder but then it's saying there's no files am i in the right spot yeah, let me see. that's weird it's on there i did we had to talk about the other they're all there okay It was just weird that part of it was there, but not. Is that yeah, that's yeah. Right. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, about thirty seconds. Okay, so uh, when we think of SEL and some of these specific competencies, what does a UDL classroom do to support the development of these in students? Uh, any, anyone care to share? are not 
not able to manage their own materials or make good decisions for themselves or don't know where to start to build a relationship with a classmate to collaborate. That's what I've seen as the, the more UBL is implemented, the more the ownership is on the student. And I think what part of what you're highlighting is uh, both in a UDL classroom, you have the opportunity to develop these, but it also, when you start to implement UDLs, some gaps in these areas emerge that, are your, that you didn't see before because they are having more control. And that's one of the things we're gonna talk about specifically in, uh, in BUDS program. So uh, when, we when we look at this, here's a list of ways that, that we found uh, these things connect with UDL. Um, and so, I think these are somewhat intuitive. A lot of what we've heard with other content at the at the IRN, um, but a lot of it has to do with uh, that shifting control, increased accountability for students, and the opportunity for them to develop these skills, but also the opportunity for you to see where they need to develop these skills. All right, so. Our two schools that we're hearing from today are very different schools, and uh, I'm gonna introduce Bud. Bud is the uh, staff development teacher at Alternative Programs, and um, one of the great things from Bud's background is, right now he's a staff development teacher at this program that he's gonna talk to you about and describe, but he also spent many years as a consulting teacher working within our professional growth system that is organized around skillful teaching. So one key ingredient that he's able to bring is we have a professional growth system and a, a feedback system for teachers that does not include UDL right now. And so we, we constantly have to find how do you pair these things together so the teachers don't feel like, oh, I'm gonna implement this, this framework of skillful teaching and then I'm also going to implement UDL. Uh, and that's one of the things he's done a great job with at all programs. So Bud, you could describe your program. Yeah, hi everybody. So this is the alternative school in Montgomery County. And mostly we're getting students who have not been successful in their schools. Uh, attendance has been an issue, grades have been an issue, or they've done something really, really bad and they can't be in their schools. But usually th those students, um, not always, but often there's academic problems that uh, is in their background as well. So that's the population of students that we're working with. You can see the demographics. Um, you know, it's high poverty, it's a high minority population. Um, and they do have uh, significant learning barriers. They've not been successful in their schools academically for the most part. We have a, a couple that did something really bad, but were actually really good students. But for the most part, they're struggling. They're struggling students. Um, we talk a lot about the the brain research and that came up in the show this morning. Our students also come to us very much on high alert. Um, you know, they it doesn't take much for them to, to feel threatened and uncomfortable in the school, and that's. Another big part of UDL is to try to reduce that threat level and make them feel more comfortable in their classrooms. So that's why we think it's uh, a good fit for our population of students. And so for, for Barbara, Barbara's at Hoover Middle School and she'll describe that school a little bit. Uh, very different from Bud's program overall. Barbara was the staff development teacher there for the entire school and then more recently uh, became the head of a program for students with emotional disabilities uh, at, at, the, at the school. And so her, her role has shifted, her focus on UDL has not. Um, but I'll let Barbara describe Hoover a little bit. Hi, everybody. Um, Hoover Middle School is a very high performing school in Montgomery County. Typically on state and county assessments, our students score the top scores. And that's what we're known for in many instances around the county and state. I've gone from being staff development for the whole school and working with all of our teachers to working with a group of students who's caught in our achievement gap, which would be my students in our bridge program. Within Hoover, we have a self-contained special ed program where all the learning is done in a closed environment. While we hope to bridge students out to mainstream and incorporate them in an inclusion environment, our students receive very specific instruction on, on grade level content by our special ed teachers in this self-contained unit with mental health supports. So I come at this from two different perspectives. Um, 
as I said, most of our students achieve at very high levels. Then you have many of my students who are caught in the achievement gap who are not necessarily there yet, as well as some other groups of students within our building. So for us, when we talk UDL, for my students, it's significantly important because of the breaking barriers providing pathways for their learning and for their accessing learning. But I'm also going to just mention with our really high performers, it's getting those students to have experiences that stretch them, that cause them to take risks that they might not otherwise take that learn other ways of approaching problems because many times those learners who come to us are learners who want the right answer and I want to get it done, my assignment's over, okay. And we want to build them into expert learners as well as the students I teach on a daily basis. And for our school, UDL has been one of the ways we are working on that. And the SEL piece is really important with all the groups of students we're working with. So as we, as we look at these two schools, I'm just gonna describe these and we'll get into them a, a little more detail as we're sharing some of the resources. They've had different pathways to implement UDL. And so one key element that we do, which I'm gonna describe, uh, typically when we support schools is we have a leadership PLC related to UDL. And that's a core group of teachers uh, which you know, do some deep implementation. And then our, our really uh, uh, kind of the ground level at the school of sharing practices to inform uh, the growth throughout the school. Um, at alternative programs, there, there has not been one, and uh, that's partly because it was a, a board mandate and the timing, I think, uh, was, was pushed a little quicker. Um, at Hoover Middle School, there's been a UDL leadership PLC for five years. Uh, another key uh, touch point of implementation is if there is, in fact, school-wide professional learning around this, uh, both of the, at, at alternative programs, it's been a year and a half, Hoover, three years. Uh, we have uh, our schools with their school improvement plans. They pick an instructional focus. Uh, at both schools, that's, that's only been in place for about a year and a half, that UDL has been their instructional focus. Uh, and then the last piece is implementation monitoring. So some systemic way of, of capturing is UDL happening and the impact that it's ha having on, on learners. Uh, in both cases, that's been for a year and a half. So this is relatively early on in the implementation process, but with Hoover, they've had a foundation of, of building this up over, over many years. What we would like for you to see is that in our county, when we go and we look at what needs to change in a school, we follow something called a root cause analysis. And we want to take you through that reasoning process that these schools, two very different schools, use to arrive at the combination of pairing UDL and SEL and, and what resources they do to use, to use, use to do that. So I'll start with Bud, describe that a little bit. Right, so this is the process that begins about this time of year in every school in, in Montgomery County. And it really starts with looking at your data. It's all of your big picture data items and asking questions about that data. Why is this student group not performing as well as this group? Why at our school, for example, why is our attendance so low? You, you look at these basic data points, come up with questions, and then you come up with some responses to that. So attendance is low maybe because the classrooms aren't engaging and students just don't want to come. And once you come up with some responses, then you collect data to try to make a connection between those responses and the problems that you're seeing. And these represent all the different sources of data that you can look at and should be looking at. You want to have a variety of data sources. One of the most important ones is the student voice piece of this data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, how we've done that. Um, but the idea is so you get all this data and you try to make connections with what you're seeing in the classrooms, um, with the issues you're seeing in the data, and you keep asking more and more questions until you get down to the point where, okay, there's, we see what's happening here. And that becomes your school's instructional focus. So for us, you know, we saw a lack of engagement, we saw some issues, and um, we decided that UDL would be a, a, a way for us to address those issues. So the idea of the root cause analysis is just to, to keep looking at the data, keep asking questions about it, until you finally get to that, that piece that you think, okay, this could, this is really what's happening here, and we can, form a plan to address that. And that becomes the basis of every school's school improvement plan. 
So Bud share with you a little bit about, um, about their process at, at all programs. Uh, I think uh, one thing to know is really it's with the instructional focus, that term, when schools pick that, it's, it really fits into this, this frame of students at all programs most need dot dot dot. And so uh, your, your, your process led you to what? Right. So uh, we're in a, uh, also a, a redesign of our school as well. And before the redesign happened, they were collecting all this data and, you know, we have to, grades are low, attendance was low, and they're trying to figure out what we can do about this. And really the, the outstanding piece of data that stood out, especially during the observations, is that there was just a lot of direct teaching going on. And it was the same kind of teaching that these students had been in in their comprehensive high schools that wasn't working. That's why they're with us. But we're still teaching the same way and somehow expecting different results. So that uh, the people that worked on the redesign, they wanted to, to change that direction. They wanted to change that, that, that methodology and make teachers think differently about how they were going about this. So they chose UDL as, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try to change teachers' thinking about how they deliver instruction, and that will hopefully move them away from that direct mode of teaching. And that became our instructional focus. And then you write a school improvement plan that um, provides the learning to the teacher so that they can implement that instructional focus. And you measure the results and, um, and reflect and see how it's going and then and decide at the end of the year, is this, are we moving in the right direction? Has it changed teacher practice? Um, do they have the resources they need? And it's all part of the, the school improvement plan. So in the root cause analysis folder of your shared documents, their, their process for this is, for both schools are there. And I think that's important because we need to, to describe to people why this might be the answer to a question that they have. You have to be clear in your mind what your logic is behind that. And the whole point of uh, this root cause analysis process and the school improvement plan is to make that logic transparent. And so if you look at these when, uh, as these, these resources, you can get a real clear indication of that thinking process that can be helpful to maybe in your situation. I want to say that this is where our schools are very similar even though you're talking different students profiles perhaps when we looked at our engagement walkthroughs when we looked at our data we came up with the same questions so much of our instruction was teacher centered teacher focused and how do we get it student centered student focused and one of the interesting pieces of data collection we did was through one of our departments where we surveyed a thousand students within one class, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Every teacher surveyed for five periods a day. And one of the questions was on engagement. How engaged are you with instruction? And when we saw the data, you know, 10% of the students said they were not engaged with instruction. And some of the teachers said, wow, that means 90% are. But then when you look at what 10% represents, and when you look at your achievement gap, and when you look at engaging students, that then became, wow, we have 100 kids who are not. What do we need to do? Plus, there are other students who could use more engagement, too. So that, that was a big eye-opener to change, which w this is all about. So hopefully both those resources can be helpful to you as you go back to your, uh, your schools or programs. Uh, the next thing that is important for us to share uh, with each other in this UDL community are, are resources for professional learning and specifically resources that can make this connection between SEL and UDL. So we want to share with you a, a few of those. Um, one thing that happens in our county with staff development teachers is they develop learning progressions. And it, with, with universal design for learning, we make a lot of, of uh, strategic errors, I think, with the scope and sequence by which we introduce UDL uh, and learn about it. And sometimes we, we lead with things that uh, either send teachers down the wrong path or uh, turn them off to this pretty early on. And so in, in your folder, uh, you have specific learning progressions that both these school, schools used about how they introduced, what concepts of UDL were introduced first, how they built that in with application um, and, and classroom visits, um, and how that, how that all looks. So hopefully that'll be useful to you, but I also want each of them to describe a little bit about key elements of that process for them. 
So you have your school improvement plan, which has an instructional focus, and within that plan, you also have a plan for what the staff needs to know in order to implement that instructional focus and what your leadership needs to know to implement that instructional focus. And you spell that out very clearly. And then, really, my job as staff development teacher is to design a plan to deliver that training to those people, both the staff and the leaders. So you can uh, go to the next. So we talk about in Montgomery County, uh, both macro and micro level learning, and that's what I have to design a plan to deliver that. The macro learning is really the, the theoretical part, and the micro learning is more about the actual planning and implementation that you want teachers to do. So for us, I designed uh, a series of learning cycles that were about four weeks long, maybe five weeks long, which is pretty quick. But uh, last year when we were really first digging into UDL, each learning cycle focused on one principle of UDL. And in that four week cycle, we'd spend one week just talking about the principle, this is what it means, this is what it, what it looks like, give them examples. And then they'd have a chance the next week to plan with their colleagues, plan an actual lesson that would involve that principle and then the week after that, they would actually implement that lesson plan. Somebody would go and observe them, possibly me, or a peer would observe them. And then we'd come back at the end of the learning cycle and reflect, you know, how did it go? What was the problems? Did it go well? Did it not go well? Um, so it's that cycle of, of plan, do, act, and, and reflect, and, and we kept doing that. And we had a, a learning cycle that went with each principal, and that's how we we trained the teachers, you know, to really get them that base level of knowledge and to give them practice in implementing it and giving them feedback on their implementation as well. Leadership learning should be happening parallel to that as well because they're going to be supporting those teachers. So they need to understand this uh, as well as, if not better than the, than the teachers do. So, um, like I said before, a key element of what we found to be best practice when, when implementing UDL is to get a, a UDL leadership PLC started, and that can be concurrent with uh, whole school or whole program learning about UDL. But the purpose of that is to get that core group of people who, you know, you've selected a group of people who are already pretty skillful teachers, uh, are interested in not just learning and changing, but leading. And so uh, the focus of our learning for the UDL PLC, half of it is about UDL and half is it about being a, a school, a, a teacher leader uh, with UDL. And that's been a component that's worked well for us. Um, on your resources, there's a list, and I apologize for the resolution on some of these. I'm not sure uh, why it's not coming up, but uh, the, it has a, when you pull this up, it has a real scope and sequence throughout the year of how you can blend these two things with having a UDL leadership PLC and school-wide learning uh, and how they can support each other. So that can be a, a good planning document for you. On the Hyatt website, there's details about what is a UDL leadership PLC and what you can do to, to get it started with real specific specific resources. At Hoover, uh, five years ago, we started a UDL leadership PLC. Uh, Barbara was the, the leader on that. Uh, and that continued uh, last year when they were starting to do more of a school-wide focus on UDL. And this is just a, a little description of what's the, what's the scope and sequence and the work of that UDL leadership PLC. And so the first half of the year, it was really focused on them expanding their experimentation with UDL. And in this case, these were people who had done some with adding choice and variety in, into their classroom and their materials. And what we were really trying to get them to focus on more was this expert learner piece and, and getting the students to build their metacognition skills, understanding uh, how to implement routines related to self-reflection and to drive this a little deeper. And then the second half of the year, their charge was to turn outwards more towards the entire school and share some of these practices, whether through a classroom video or having uh, visitors into their classroom, doing peer visits, to show these examples of the leading edge of implementation. And that's the, the core construct with this UDL leadership PLC is they, are, they represent the leading edge of implementation in your school and a model that everyone can, can reach towards. So that, that happened at, at uh, Hoover and has been an important component. Another thing that we focused on at both UDL and Hoover is this concept of everyday UDL. And this is critical when you're, if you're interested in the SEL benefits of implementing UDL or making these connections. 
because what we found is you can teach teachers about UDL, but when you teach teachers about UDL and they view it as something that they'll do when they have enough time to plan for it, or that it's a special event uh, that is tied to a big project, you don't get the benefits of UDL, and you especially don't get the benefits related to the social emotional growth of students. It has to be patterns and routines. So when we introduce UDL at both these schools, what we've asked teachers to do is not to lesson plan necessarily for UDL. What we've asked them to do is routine planning. So what, what, what new routine are you gonna build into your classroom? And Kim St. John this morning talked about that, is you know, her activator, the change in that made a difference. Part of the reason it made a difference was the students were coming back to that every day. And she was, every day she was asking them about how, how they felt about it. And she was curious about new ways that they were demonstrating their learning. That didn't happen once a quarter. It happened every day. It was built into her routines. So that's something that we've really emphasized more and more when we're training teachers on this. And a, a key takeaway for you as you go back to your schools is don't view it, don't, this isn't about playing hero ball with UDL. Uh, and trying to knock it out of the park. It's about taking that first step to say, what happens every day in my classroom? So like for, for parents who are trying to make a meal, uh, you know, you, you may have your Bon Appetit meal that you're planning uh, when, you, when you have a nice weekend to read a magazine or look on the internet, but the reality is you need to pick something like chicken on a grill that you can do well and do every day uh, that's really gonna, gonna work better for you, work better for your family, and that's the same thing we, we focus on with uh, with everyday UDL as a concept at the schools. Uh, so at Hoover, uh, just a, a, a resource that you have in here was something we asked the teachers to do was just an everyday UDL planning sheet. So having really given them specific guidance on pick something that happens every day in your classroom, like an activator, note taking, uh, you know, uh, an exit ticket, and look at what you currently do, and then how can you use this UDL lens to add some more choice, some more pathways for students into the process. And this is a low-risk activity, like Kim was saying. Uh, when you introduce it to staff, they're typically uh, not terribly threatened by trying something new with this. Uh, and once they start doing this, your hope, and what we found is that they do see the benefit. They realize the, the, the world didn't fall apart when they brought Plato into their eighth grade uh, English classroom. And, and the kids were more engaged, and then you got a little money in the bank to say, okay, now let's look at the bigger things, and let's keep move this forward. But you do have to keep moving it forward, but I think this concept is important. So when you, as you start to implement these things, one of the things that we talked about in the, with the school improvement plan is you need to know what's happening, if there's change happening, if that change actually reflects uh, the changes you want with the UDL and SEL. And so we wanna look at some resources that these schools have used to, to address that. So uh, Bud's, Bud's gonna mention briefly about the personalized learning plan at, at alternative programs. So there are a number of ways that we monitor the implementation and and see what teachers are doing and how we're doing it one way for us is all of our students have personalized learning plans and in that plan it's uh it's a lot of information about the student that the teacher can use to plan instruction it also has student learning goals it also has sel goals as well but the main connection to udl is there is a place in that plan for a teacher to push information up to that plan so Let's say they find out that a particular student um, uh, can communicate what they understood much better verbally than if you force them to, to write it down. And if that's an okay thing for a particular situation, they put that information in the PLP so that other teachers know that about that student. They basically say, look, if you have the opportunity, this student knows a lot, but they can't write it down. But if you have the opportunity to let them tell you what they know, you're going to see that they know what they're doing. So there's a place in that PLP, and uh, we can see teachers entering things in that PLP when they learn something about the student through the fact that they're implementing UDL in their classroom, and students are uh, have options and are selecting options, and they find out about the student, and that gets pushed up to that document. And just to clarify here, because you can't see it, so this is the the plan, and you have the, you have the plan in your folder, uh, but this is the an individual student's PLP, and it looks at representation and engagement and action and expression uh, and, and student perceptions and teacher perceptions. And so when they sit down to plan this one, well, I was in one, one meeting where they were talking about a student's PLP and the science teacher had all these examples of this very 
diff the student was having a lot of difficulty with just being in school uh, and, and, and not causing harm to others, uh, how engaged he was when he had the opportunity to build models. And so that got fed up into the PLP, uh, and then other teachers were able to say, okay, I can find ways for him to work with models in math. I can find ways to do that in social studies. And, and that's how that process is, is kind of set up. So you have this uh, in, your, in your folder. Um, also in there, it provides a nice example of this goal setting related to these specific CASEL indicators for SEL. And so if you can look at this, you can see this is a, a measure, a process by which they measure both for the PLP to inform the practices in the classroom. But like Bud was saying, this is also a monitoring tool that this is a, a live document. Uh, principal can pull it up and say, hey, what's happening with our students? Are they actually collecting this classroom data on their student voice, on their performance, and how it ties in with the UDL and the, the SEL pieces? So this document can provide that kind of organizing influence and. Um, I know there's a lot of professional personalized learning plans out there. Uh, this one has some elements that might be helpful for you specific to this SEL piece. Um, and then another element of UDL is, like Linda was talking about this morning, this is not just about uh, what teachers do, it's about how they think, is, is what we're measuring when we're saying is UDL happening. And, and you're getting closer to measuring student uh, teachers' thinking when you look at their planning, their collaborative planning. What are they talking about? How are they uh, you know, looking at student barriers? Where, where are they describing and how are they visioning uh, different pathways for learning and what's, what's their plan for student reflection? And we developed and shared with you some planning look fors that, that they've used at both schools about what UDL looks like in that discussion process, that design process. And that's something that we found uh, we're emphasizing more and more as a meaningful measure of implementation. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Barbara to talk a little bit about this compare and contrast with uh, teacher voice and student voice data when you're looking at measuring implementation. So one thing that we did when we were getting into um, looking at our instructional focus was getting teacher and student voice data on the same set of questions related to student engagement. Um, Bill and I originally gave a survey to all of the students in PLC members' classrooms. So we surveyed like 450 students in the building. And when we started seeing the data from those surveys, we then determined to give it to the whole school body. And then we also gave it to the teachers. So certain questions like, um, I'm engaged in class most of the time, all of the time, and so on. We gave those same questions to our teachers. And things like the student engagement, our teachers felt their students were receiving engaging lessons 100% of the time, and our students' number wasn't 100% of the time. So any of those questions where we saw significant discrepancies, um, those were the kinds of things that we looked at in determining what is causing our students to have issues with achievement, what is putting obstacles in their way for learning. And it also helped us focus our conversation as a leadership team to um, get to an instructional focus that made sense for the needs of our students. So that's something we will continue to do. You did it also, Bud. And that it's just a very enlightening process is to have the two sets of questions. They're the same questions, but two perspectives. So key point as you go back is if you're not already doing this, 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 this concept of, of using student voice data and teacher voice data to one measure implementation but also to make adjustments to it is really important and just seeing that as the teachers see this as, you know, uh, we are implementing UDL, the, 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 the students don't perceive it at all. You know, so what does that tell you? You know, what work do you at? What work's still to be done in that regard? The engagement surveys that we used at Hoover were based on uh, the developed by a research group in our county, and it really looked at different areas of engagement, effective in date engagement, intellectual engagement, um, you know, really specific areas. So that's a, a useful resource for you as you go back, and it also uh, shows some examples in your folder of uh, some ways that we presented and used that information to inform the, the growth process at the, at the school. So uh, I guess uh, 
Barbara, can you talk a little bit about the role that walkthroughs or learning walks related to UDL have played at your school? For our school, it's played a significant role because we have had the PLC for five years now. We have been doing walkthroughs since the beginning, and those walkthroughs have let us know where we are in our learning, where the students are in taking their role, becoming expert learners. Um, we send teams to classrooms for the walkthrough to collect data, then we pull that data together, we find commonalities, we find um, things that are working quite well, then we look at possible upgrades that again guides us in these growths or the uh, learning cycles that we'll plan for um, our staff and for our leadership team. And this year, I know we did much more um, focusing on the metacognitive piece. We get more and more refined each year. We're not just looking for the basics now. We're getting to some of the next level in this. And are the students getting an opportunity to reflect on their learning and how they're becoming expert learners? And so in your folder, you have two different sets of, of uh, instructional look-fors that we've used. Uh, one is kind of the, the, the starting point, which, you know, you're, you're in, a, you're in a, a building where there is a lot of, of lecture, rows of desks. There's very little choice or variety at all going on. And those look-fors give you some metered way of, of giving, getting teachers to make changes that are fairly concrete related to giving them choice and building in variety. Um, and then we have some later stages of implementation that focus a lot more on the key elements of the, the meta-learning. So uh, how teachers frame choices for students, that they make their UDL design transparent in the way they talk to kids, uh, that they, they have specific methods by which they coach students through the different pathways they've been given, and then finally that they, they're building in multiple methods for reflection on how the students learn best. So those are both in your folder. And I, I just think it's, it, it's really important to think about um, you know, being specific of what, what you're looking for and is it in a language that the teachers understand, in a language that they can translate easily to students, in a language that administrators, your leadership learning, that they can pick it up and, and go into a classroom and, and be looking for this in a meaningful way. So those are our examples, and uh, there's a lot of other ones out there, but hopefully you, you, find, you, you find these uh, useful. I will say one thing I think we've done a good job of is when we've developed these, they were, they're what teachers tell us they change. And so our initial ones were after uh, six months of teaching teachers about UDL with some grants that I was working on. They were, we went to the teachers and we said, not, we don't wanna know what you think UDL is, we wanna know what you changed. Uh, because a lot of things in UDL are things that are in our skillful teaching framework uh, and good teaching practices, but we wanna know what's the, what's the distinct things you changed that you feel like made a difference. And so our look fors are organized around those, which we've we found helpful. Um, I'm gonna mention this briefly for Bud, just this is an informal observation tool, and one of the things that he's done here is, uh, when you pull this up, is integrate uh, the skillful teaching framework and our standards with UDL, which many of you, as you go back to your buildings, your, you know, very few districts are focused on UDL uh, as a comprehensive way of, in their teacher evaluation system. And so you're having to blend these things together, and this, to me, is a nice example of what Bud has done at his program to blend these two things together in a meaningful way that doesn't make it look like one more thing, but also doesn't diminish uh, the, the implementation rigor that we want with UDL. So in our uh, minutes we have left, we want to go over kind of an update on how things are going uh, at, at, the, at the two schools uh, related to SEL and those two elements of cultivating a foundation and a ground for that, these to develop and also the competencies and related to expert learners. And I think as we, I'm gonna turn it over to Bud and, and Barbara, but all of you are here, I, I'm guessing, because you've actually done implementation, not just thinking about implementation, and you know it gets messy and it, it's complicated. And certainly at, at Bud's school, it's a complicated environment. And so uh, he's gonna update you on how, how things are going there. And then Barbara will, will talk a little bit about, uh, about Hoover as well. So why don't we start with you, Barbara, just kinda. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Um, for us, it was really important in year one to have a core group of teachers. Linda and Bill worked with us constantly during year one. And we had almost 20 teachers who worked together 
to really learn about UDL. And having that core group of competent learners who were willing to implement supported us in this consequent, this, you know, the, the following years to have someone in every department on every team with some base knowledge that they could start sharing within those teams. And that really helped the UDL message get out to our staff, so that was significant. Having the walkthroughs, really, really important, because if you're not getting to the implementation, you're not causing any change, and why are you doing it? So that was another piece that I'm really glad that we have continued to do the peer visits. Um, where we are right now, which is um, a new place, it's what Bud is doing too at his school, now we ask questions about UDL when we do formal observations and we're including it in our observation write-ups of students or of teachers excuse me where I will have teachers not only tell me about you know what it is you taught and why you taught it and what's the sequence of what you taught but how did you implement a UDL framework into your work how did you provide students an opportunity to think about being expert learners and also um, having the informal observation tool now where we do do all of our informals with a UDL base since it's part of our um, school instructional focus. And the big piece is just for us to keep going. Um, it's easy to sort of fall back and say, okay, we've got this, we're all doing this. You're never done and we have to keep moving forward. And I think we're getting there. Um, but again, it's with the support of Hyatt team. So uh, I would say at all programs, we're, we're doing okay. Uh, I'm pleased with uh, the teacher's knowledge of UDL. I think they understand how to plan forward in mind. A lot of them have, have been doing it. I have evidence. I've observed them, them planning for it. Um, I think I'm probably most happy that it is part of our language now in the school. Uh, it, everybody knows that this is what we're at least supposed to be doing. And you can have conversations with teachers and you're all on the same page with the language. Um, I would say the implementation is not as widespread as I would like it to be at this point, although we're still kind of new into it. It's been a year and a half. Um, but uh, it is a difficult environment, and we have some teachers that say this is difficult to do in the face of some of the student behavior that's being presented. Um, and the idea is that we're trying to work with those teachers, saying that this could help in that problem, that this might uh, reduce some of the behavior that you're seeing. But that's, that's a bit of an uphill climb at the moment. Um, where we have not gone as far as I want us to do is the metacognitive piece. We focused on reflection in the beginning of the school year and um, I, and again I know the teachers they get it, they know it, but they're still not incorporating it on a regular basis and somehow I need to impress upon them how how critical this piece is when our goal is for students to become expert learners that if we're not reflecting with them we're, we're not going to get there. That's It's a missing piece, it's a piece that has to be there. Um, but the language part is what I'm most most happy with. But we have, uh, I think every school, you have some teachers who really get it. And, you know, they'll come to me and say, hey, I'm doing a great lesson. Come and check it out. And, and they have, you know, all kinds of great options for their students. Um, and I think you talked about the everyday UDL piece as well. And that's something we're also working more on. Because I, our teachers do feel like this is something that they do when they have a big project. So they want to give their students multiple ways to, to complete the project. We are continuing to try to impress upon them that uh, what we'd call small UDL. Uh, something as simple as if you give them text to read, you give them some highlighters as well, which they might not have thought of before. But that's something some kids will need that to, to get through that text. So those little things, we're still, we're still working on that, that piece. But um, you know, I, I, think, I think we're doing OK. Okay, and uh, we're going to take qu take some questions in a in a bit, but I, I want to just go over some lessons learned, which I talked about some of them. Uh, I I really would encourage you if you're if you are implementing UDL to to do a UDL leadership PLC for the reasons that I stated before. I think it's just it's it's critical to having some genuine practices to share, and also to have that leading edge of implementation in your building that you can draw from. 
uh, and and keep this keep this on on track. And so I would really encourage you to do that. Another key element that we've learned sometimes in the hard way is you have to train your leaders on UDL. Yeah, sometimes, again, I think this happens with, with whatever you're doing, you just, you're so focused on the teachers uh, that you forget that no one ever gave this AP, assistant principal, any training on this. And now he or she is going in the classrooms and, uh, you know, dinging the teacher for something which, because he doesn't understand what's happening. And uh, they're so busy sometimes and moving so quick, even when they're supposed to be in sessions or uh, you know, participating in things, they don't. And one key way that we've accomplished this, I think at both programs, we realize we need to do more, is uh, we need to have them involved with walkthroughs. And so that that's like, that happens and it, it's, it's a critical element. I also think uh, Bud's has, has an, his example that you have about the planning look fors. Uh, we really focused much more this year with the leaders in the building on how to coach with UDL and uh, giving them some structure on, on how to do that. And then for the principal to monitor from his perspective, hey, did this, when this resource teacher, the head of the social studies department was in classroom, what did you say related to UDL to this teacher? Um, and let me, let me be able to read that. So both in terms of learning, but also the monitoring that you need to include leaders in that. Uh, and finally, tying in with that concept of everyday UDL, uh, you know, this doesn't happen, although all, none of these benefits happen if this is a once in a while thing. And all of the potential benefits of how UDL can support U SEL is dependent on, on patterns. You know, patterns of opportunities for interaction, patterns for opportunities for viewing yourself differently as a learner, patterns of opportunity for understanding in your classroom where everyone is doing different things and capacities look very different across learners. And so that's, that's a key element. So if you are implementing this, uh, that you keep in mind that you're not going to see the benefit unless it's something that is really ingrained on a routine basis. So I would, I would suggest you, you take that, that as one of your key takeaways and something that we have to kind of relearn <laughs> again and again by, by seeing, seeing this get off rails a little bit. Uh, so that's, those are the resources. Those are kind of the way, the way that we have, have viewed them. Uh, any, any questions for Bud or Barbara on what's happening in their schools? How many of you are concurrently working on SEL as, as a instructional focus at your school in our county? Okay. Well, besides CASEL, are there resources on CASEL that you use to your students in the classroom? There's, there's, um, there's quite a bit on that, on that website. And what's that? Yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that website has been, been our main resource. Really, um, uh, what we're focusing on is providing opportunities to practice those SEL skills. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced our teachers understand the competencies deeply enough yet, um, but for me that's the connection between UDL and SEL, is that UDL provides opportunities, because if you're talking about good decision making, UDL provides an environment for you to make those decisions. So it's those opportunities to have SEL discussions with students and help them think about those skills. Um, but we're, we're, CASEL is still our main, our main resource there. And I was gonna say, I've used it with um, our full staff and had them explore that as well as CAST, as well as a high number of resources. But the big piece for us with the SEL too is when you start getting to that student centered learning and starting to learn about your students learning styles their likes their dislikes how they can be successful what keeps them from being successful at other times it's that whole relationship building piece when you're going for constant consistent feedback from students that we have found to be really supportive with connecting the SEL and the UDL Okay, well thanks, thanks for your time. Uh, hopefully those resources end up being helpful for you going forward. And if you wanna get in touch with any of us, uh, look forward to learning from, from you and, and finding ways to support you in making the connection between these two things and 
implementing both of them with uh, in a way that can work for your school. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks.